what happens when you pause. You're able to look at and reflect on, so what's happening here? And how do I want to respond to this? And if I am in a state of suffering, how can I uh, be liberated? What can I let go of or release? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Nishant and welcome to another episode of the Nishant Gurk Show. The mission of the show is to spread mindfulness awareness and my job on the show is to invite world-class experts to extract the practices, routines and habits to live a fulfilled life. Today's guest is Donald Altman. Donald is a psychotherapist, international mindfulness expert and award-winning author of over 15 books translated worldwide. Featured as expert in the mindfulness movie and profiled in the Living Spiritual Teachers Project, his best-selling book, The Mindfulness Toolbox, won two national publishing awards as best book in both the psychology and mind-body spirit categories. Two other books, Clearing Emotional Clutter and The Mindfulness Code, were both chosen as one of the best spiritual books of the year by spirituality and practice. Donald has presented at the National Symposium Conference multiple times and his work has been seen in the Psychotherapy Networker, Los Angeles Times and other publications. In this episode, Donald talks about kindness, compassion, pausing and reflecting, acceptance, your karma is in your refrigerator, meditations, glad and great practice and much, much more. Now, let the episode begin. Donald, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Nishan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And, and I, and I really am excited to share ideas with you and your audience. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure and I'm so thrilled. While I was doing some homework on your books and on your long history of mindfulness success, I got to know that you used to be a monk can we start with your monk journey? How did you get into becoming a monk? Well, this may be a bit of a cautionary tale <laughs> because um, there was a friend of mine who said, you know, there's a monk I, I, I think you should meet. And I met that monk and his name was Uthilananda. He was from Burma. He was a well-known teaching monk. He came here in the late, I think in the late 70s with Jack Cornfield's teacher, who was Mahasi Siyada both also from Burma. And so they came here and, and uh, Uthilananda had this incredible, wonderful sense of availability and compassion. And it was very palpable. I sensed it from him, even in a brief meeting that I had. And it really intrigued me. I'd never met anybody like that before. And so it got me thinking, how does somebody become like that? How do they actually embody that kind of open you know, awareness and attentiveness and availability to help. And so I, a, a period later in my life, when I was going through a challenging time, I had an opportunity to ordain with Uthi Nanda as the uh, head of the monastery. And so I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to learn from him. And in fact, he had written a book, The Four Foundations of Mindfulness. It's still in publication uh, he was a very traditional teacher, but yet he was also had, had uh, kind of in a very nice way, kind of become a little westernized. So he'd be leading the loving kindness practice, which, by the way, I found out was his favorite practice. And I think that was how he had developed that wonderful sense of compassion. So he'd be teaching the loving kindness practice. And at some point he'd say, you know, um, just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved hearing him say, you know, just go with it, right? Just get curious, go with it. Very American way of thinking about it, even though, again, he was a very traditional uh, teacher in that tradition. But he had a great amount of kindness. He wasn't uh, so strict and regimented. And uh, so it was wonderful to learn mindfulness from him and also was a wonderful group of monks in that monastery it was a monastery in the u.s but they were all burmese monks and so they were supported by a burmese community and we would have our lunches together and i remember that was uh, something that i 
uh, had struggled with in my life. I had used food in an emotional uh, way to uh, comfort me. And I didn't know if I'd be able to uh, not eat after 12 noon in that particular tradition, which is the Theravada tradition of Buddhism. You have a very early morning meal at about 6 to 6.30. You have uh, uh, lunch from 11 to noon, and then you don't eat after that. And I really wondered if I would be able to have the discipline to you know, uh, stick to that routine. And it was really fascinating because I learned a lot about when you apply a lot of mental focus and energy, that you do get a lot of discipline, ability to have discipline in other areas of your life. And I really think that with mindfulness, one of the things I learned from Uthi Lunanda and being in, uh, in that monastery with the monks is to apply effort, discipline, and energy to something. In fact, the name they gave me when I was in the monastery, because of course you shed your old life and let go of your old name. And, and the name they gave me was Uwairama. In fact, the monks, they're all there looking at you and they're kind of talking to one another and trying to figure out what name they should give you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and they gave me the same Uwairama. And I said, well, what does that mean? And they said, it means effort, right? Effort is one of the noble eightfold paths in the Buddhist tradition. And it kind of stunned me because I, I realized I had never really put in the spiritual effort and they gave me this name, and in a way, really inspired me, too. So that was kind of how I uh, yeah. really steeped myself more into uh, learning about the nature of the mind and how uh, wonderful it is to learn about that. And it can give us uh, very effective ways of uh, liberating ourselves from a lot of suffering. What did you learn from your monk experience and what mindfulness practices were you able to learn at that point? Well, you know, we would routinely every day we would do mindful walking and that was a wonderful practice and something I like to incorporate into my day, just moving, being present. The monks would work on the ground. So sometimes we would be, you know, removing a tree or, you know, and just digging the roots out from a tree and seeing how deep those roots go. Right. And that we have, we, our lives can be very deep and very grounded and very rooted. And sometimes we forget that we live on the surface. We live on the, the superficial character, you know, nature of things. And we don't spend time to reflect and to cultivate and nurture those deep roots that are really uh, a wonderful part of our lives, provide meaning and sustenance to us. So I think that's one of the other things that I learned just by doing the work and being present with it, being open and being fully present with the other people and cooperating together in that community was a wonderful experience. And so also there was daily meditation and so forth that's still part of my life. But I think it was also the uh, connection with others. For example, during uh, mealtime in the dining room, there were our uh, signs on the wall that said noble silence. So we would eat in silence. But yet, even though we were in silence, there was a tremendous amount of attentiveness and connection to the other monks sitting at the table with you. So what I noticed was as soon as my, you know, I'd finished eating, somebody would be holding out a, you know, bowl of rice for me or something else. And they were all, everybody was all aware. And, and we were all connected. So I never felt that not eating at the table that I was missing anything. And in fact, I felt that it kind of really enhanced my experience of connectivity yes. to everyone, allowed me to pay more attention instead of just um, talking. There are so many practices you have mentioned in our brief conversation about mindful walking, loving kindness, meditation, silence. And I would love to cover those details uh, going, going on in this conversation. I would love to ask you, silence can be hard for a lot of people. Were you always comfortable with being silent or does it come naturally to you? Or do you practice being really good at silent? You know, that's a good question. I think it will vary from person to person. I think it, before I went to the monastery, I, mean, I was a writer in terms of a career. And so that's kind of a silent, uh, solitary way of working. And even though your mind can be very active, but the silence part of it 
uh, yeah, it felt fairly natural to me, but I, but I had to be intentional with it because sometimes we would have the impulse to just talk and it made us think about talking with a purpose. So you wouldn't be gossiping or you wouldn't be uh, complaining or you wouldn't, right? You give thought to whatever it is that you're saying. And you would try to think about if what you were saying was beneficial or harmful, right? So there was, so it added, it, it brought in to my way of, of uh, thinking and being this idea of uh, being more uh, intentional moment to moment with my, with my words. And so that sometimes something might happen and I, I learned that I could forbear, I could, I could pause instead of just react and maybe in an angry way. I'm not saying that never happens. Sure, I'm like anybody else. I can have those moments, but I've learned to do a lot better job at pausing, reflecting, even forbearing. Forbearing, Forbearance is a wonderful practice that I think many of us probably don't, don't use enough of, <laughs> which when means you say, it just... It's, I want to cover this. When you, when you are speaking uh, in silence, you are pausing and you are reflecting back on what you're saying. What does this reflection look like? What are you basically reflecting on? Yeah, so the word reflect actually means, if you look back to the Latin meaning of it, it means to bend back. So it's like even light that you know hits a mirror, it bends back at you. And so you reflect back on what your situation is in the moment, right? You reflect on, um, how can I bring a sense of kindness, maybe a sense of wisdom, my history, my knowledge into this moment? So you're bending back your history, you're bending back your experience, you're bending back your feelings, and then you're able to share something that is more profound and hopefully more meaningful than if you were just to be reactive. And you don't need to respond immediately. And that's one thing I like to share with people. And uh, sometimes I will just not respond in the moment. And I'll take time to think about what has been said. And later I might come back and say, you know, I wanted to share with you about what we were talking about before. And I've had time to really think about this. And I think what's important is that when you reflect back and share back, that you do it with a sense of respect sense of understanding that even if you disagree that this is where that person is in this moment and that's okay right so we need to build bridges of understanding and of course i think in this particular time in history of course if you look back through history there's been dissension and and all kinds of misunderstandings brutality and so forth so we're not any different today the human condition is that we need to we're evolving and we're evolving and learning how to control those more ancient parts of our brain, which tend to be uh, defensive and more survival oriented. So as part of our evolution, we have this ability to pause and reflect. And it's a beautiful part of being human that we can uh, nourish and cultivate through yeah. the practice of mindfulness. And on the other side, this pause and reflect. I believe it doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. It doesn't come naturally to me. I have to keep practicing being positive. Yeah, I, in yeah. In fact, I, I, I uh, in, in the book, Simply Mindful, I have a chapter on reflection, and I, and I call it the P R R R, the purr practice, purring like a cat instead of uh, barking at somebody like a dog. <laughs> the purr <laughs> is purr is to pause, then reflect, and then. Uh, relate because there's the relational part of that and then repeat so we can continue to practice this throughout the day and I'd like to add to that another R which is receptivity I think that all the, the PRRR method is really about being uh, receptive and open P triple R P R R R that is P R R R yeah P R P R R R you have a book called One Minute Mindfulness. I would love to ask you, what are the practices to be mindful or achieve mindfulness in one minute? How can we do that in just one minute? Well, you know, it's an interesting question you're asking there. 
And I've often thought that, I think I might have mentioned even in that book, that the most important time in our life is the next 60 seconds. So, because this is where we get traction, this is where we are present, this is where we participate in the now moment, right? Right. If you take a nice breath right in this moment, let's everybody take a nice breath in and exhale. Ah. So what you experienced there, was that yesterday? Was that tomorrow? So these are rhetorical questions, of course, but that was very much the present moment. And so this is where we can enter into relating to others, to being kind, to having gratitude, right? right. Uh, so it, it's just a wonderful way to um, experience joy in life. Practice. Joy is very much a verb. It's very much joy. Like it comes from the word rejoice, which is, you know, how do I uh, feel most alive in the here and now? Here and now, there is a huge power in being here and now. Is there any other mindfulness practice that we can incorporate in our life within one minute, apart from breathing? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, in terms of the book, One Minute Mindfulness, mindfulness I have a, uh, you know, there's the morning mindfulness. There's mindfulness when you step in the shower for a minute, feeling the water on you, hearing the sound of the water being present, right? With all the movement of your body. There's the first taste of the morning. I'd like to everybody see if you could remember right now, what was the first taste you had today? Was it the taste just in your mouth when you woke up? Was it that minty toothpaste flavor? Was it the flavor of water, the freshness of water or food that you ate? Think about the first taste of today. There's the first time you step outside, the first time you see the sky, right? The first time you feel the warmth of the sun on your skin. So there's all these firsts that are could be practiced. You know, it's interesting, and of course, Mindfulness is just one tradition that practices being uh, faithful to the moment. The Jesuits, for example, Nishat, have what they call fidelity to the moment, a practice, right? So you could be faithful to whatever it is you're doing for the next minute. Think about sending an email and or writing a text or an Instagram or putting something up. And what if you were to take a pause? a nice mindful breath before you hit the send button. I bet a lot of people could take, could, could, would, would wish they could take back <laughs> and, and have had a moment's pause before they hit the send button, right? In, in the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that you were going through some challenging time and then you went mm -hmm. to becoming a monk. Would you mind talking about those challenging times and how you practice mindfulness? Yeah. I think, you know, I think one of the things that is wonderful is that we can use those challenging times in our lives um, because they push us, they, they pull us forward. They make us want to understand why is this happening? Why is a certain thing repeating in my life, right? Who brought this can of worms? So uh, something's happening. And in that particular time that I became a monk, I had started a a new venture and it didn't work. And I felt disparaged from that. But I recognized too, that there was a pattern repeating in my life and I wanted to go more deeply. And so that was one of the things, not just meeting that wonderful teacher at the right time, Uthi Lananda, but also this wanting to unravel this knot that was in my life and wanting to see how could I unravel it and where did this knot begin, right? And so a lot of the knot was from my own personal family history. And I think that is one knot that many of us, uh, you know, unravel maybe until the last breath that we have. But it was very helpful to see that going in and, and looking more deeply uh, helped me with that, helped me have a greater sense of acceptance for what had happened helped me have greater compassion uh, over for what had happened, not just for myself, but for the person who 
created pain for me. But sometimes we don't understand why it all happens, and that's okay too. But at least we can always find acceptance, and we can find uh, compassion. And through that, we find healing, right? So I think healing is a very much a part of the what mindfulness is really about at its core is, you know, sometimes we think, oh, it's just going to make us feel better and uh, I'm going to be more productive at work and I'll be happier. And But at its core, it teaches us about suffering. It teaches us about those unquenchable desires that we have or those expectations or demands we have on others that are unrealistic. And it teaches us us also that everybody is suffering to some extent or another. And so we're all together in this. And this may be one of the things that maybe brings us together more than anything else is that we all experience loss. We all experience grief. We all experience sadness, right? Right. We all experience some kind of unfairness in life that these are not uh, specific to any one person. This is part of the human condition. And so it, 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 brings an awareness to things that helps us then grow compassion. And mindfulness is a healing. I I love how you phrase that. I'm sure a lot of people during these times are going through very sad and painful moments. Do you have any advice or any recommendation for our listeners so that they can be more resilient during these times? Well, yes, yes, definitely. I would say, first of all, I would say try to cultivate a deep sense of understanding and compassion for others. I would say one of the things that really helps you in terms of resilience is to do something for another person, right? To help another person out in some way. If you're feeling lonely, the best way to overcome loneliness is to help someone who is lonely. So how can we help someone? right? Not to point a finger at them or to blame them, but to build a bridge and see their suffering and to help them in some way, right? And then we've, we've got somebody who is, who can, we can create a dialogue with, you know, a writer who I really, really liked was uh, David Bohm. David Bohm, B-O-H-M. He is a, was, he died, I believe in 2006. I know, much earlier than that. He died in the 90s. But David Bohm did a lot of work on, he was a quantum physicist, but he also did a lot of work about how we could communicate and connect with others. So I think this is a time when we could really learn to connect with others, especially if we're isolated and so many people are working remotely because of COVID, that we need to find a way to connect. And it's nice to connect on you know, on a remote platform over the computer, but that doesn't, that only takes us part way there. So I would say, see if you can make an effort, even if you're, as long as you're socially distancing, we can be in the presence of another and share something meaningful. Share what matters to you, right? Share right. what your passion is. And, and this is a beautiful thing. And this overcomes that loneliness uh, that can occur in our you know, current uh, day that we're dealing with. And loneliness can lead to depression and anxiety as well. So it's a great practice to help others to overcome any painful depression oh, yeah. or any anxiety feelings. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. It's very important because I think that we're probably going to see a lot of, as this continues, maybe we're going to see more, I I fear a little more depression or anxiety that's occurring. And so we need to find ways personally to try to overcome that. Yes. I would love to ask you when you wake up in the morning, what does your first 60 to 90 minutes look like? Well, I try to bring a little order into my life. I always, you know, try to uh, (laughs) clean up the bedroom, make it look, you know, make that bed again. And that's a matter of just taking care of myself, self-care. So I think the first 60 to 90 minutes is really about self-care, whether it's taking a shower, you know, preparing food, choosing the clothes that are going to make me feel good for the day, getting some nutrition, getting some protein. And what a lot of people don't recognize is that the, the part of the brain right behind the eyebrow ridge and then behind the forehead 
is the uh, prefrontal and the frontal cortex of the brain. And that's kind of our, the part of the brain that is most integrated, but also kind of considered the executive part of the brain, the thinking, judging, analyzing, decision-making part of the brain. And also behind the eyebrow ridge is really the mindful part of the brain, the part that connects with others, that can look inward and reflect. And these need protein every two to three hours to work effectively. And protein, what happens is protein actually breaks down into uh, neurotransmitters, and those can go through the blood-brain barrier and into the brain. And so these proteins are the building blocks for our neurotransmitters, for memory, for uh, mental flexibility, and so on. Yes. Actually, in, in the Simply Mindful book, I have a list of what kinds of foods actually help those different neurotransmitters. So I think self-care is probably my first 60 or 90 minutes really focused on on that, I'm giving myself a little some structure for the day and taking care of myself uh, Do you so ever that I can have a more productive day. Meditation in your morning, what does your meditation practice look like? I find that for me, I, I do meditate and I've been meditating every day. I do a lot of mantra work and other kinds of things, but I find it works better for me a little later in the day. And, 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 and that just knowing your own biological clock of when you're most alert. I prefer to do that. I prefer to do that personally in sometime in the afternoon or the early evening. Could you please explain more on your meditation practice? Is it like a traditional practice? Do you have a seated meditation? What and how many minutes? Yeah, well, I like to do a yeah, thank you for asking. I I uh, personally like to do and there's so many different kinds of meditation, but I so I tend to combine some of them. I will, in my sitting meditation, I uh, will start by saying some mantras, typically. I will do an awareness with the breath practice and do very much what I kind of, kind of what I learned in the monastery, the Vipassana method of noticing thoughts and uh, just bringing awareness back to the breath. I will also do a Dzogchen practice, which I really enjoy, which is just the eyes open, just which I especially like because I'm out, I, I live close to nature. And so I'm able to uh, just observe, just open, and just let that sort of intermingle the outer and the inner. And I've mm -hmm. actually created my own meditation for uh, breathing in what is outside and exhaling what is inside and realizing the inside outside is they're not as separate as we believe them to be. So I, 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 pretty much combine those. And then sometimes I'll complete the meditation with a loving kindness practice, kind of, that's the, I, I close in kind of a bookend, you know, may I be well, happy and at peace, free from pain, hunger and suffering, and may all beings, may we all be free, happy and at peace, free from pain, hunger and suffering. And so I'll try to send that out to others. How much time do you spend in that meditative practice? It's usually 30 minutes to an hour. It can be a lot of time for a lot of people. How do you manage that? Well, in yeah, your it can. And you don't, yeah, and you don't have to do it for that long. I mean, that is something that I, I feel fortunate that I'm um, able to do that. But you could do, and I'm a big proponent of short meditation practices. And um, like a minute, three minutes, or just being aware of your movement, you know, for one minute as you're walking or moving throughout the day, one minute sitting with nature. And that's a beautiful meditation practice. So I think what happens is that as you've been practicing for, for years, you, you kind of build a, you tailor a practice that just fits well with you. And, and it's a wonderful uh, way to just quiet everything down, to slow everything down, and just be, feel connected again to everything. And so I is, encourage everybody, even just start with a minute. This is like a mental muscle. When we start with one minute over a period of time, we can increase our time. Personally, I started with two or three minutes three years ago. Now I can easily do it for 20 to 30 minutes every day. Yeah, then you can get to 
you know, 30 minutes or, you know, then depending on your time, sometimes I'm not rigid with it. That's the other thing. Sometimes I may not have all that time. I'll just, I'll do a 15 or a 20 minute sitting meditation, but that's a seated meditation. You know, I, I think that with mindfulness, it's really a, a moment by moment practice and you're not putting a time limit on it. You're just remembering to come back to this moment. Because we forget, we get distracted, and we're in a, a very fast-moving culture. And technology, I think, has sped us up a lot. So just that practice of just remembering. And actually, Nishan, if you go back to the original meaning of the word sati, which is often translated as mindfulness, the original meaning for it means to self-recollect and self-remember. Isn't that a wonderful idea? It it's kind of bringing back the lost, fragmented, discordant parts of yourself and bringing yourself back to wholeness again. And that's how I think of it. That's how I think of mindfulness. Yes. You know, we don't have to be perfect at it. We just need to remember and come back. Looking at the it's nature, it. looking at the trees, being present is a meditative practice. Buddha oh, was okay. asked, what have you learned from meditation? So, Donald, I would love to ask you, what have you learned from meditation? <laughs> you know, I I don't know if I've learned anything as much as I've just, it's an experience that kind of transforms you somehow. Uh, it changes your cellular being. It changes how you experience things. It changes... So it's more of an, it's more a, a transmutation of your being, and rather than you know, writing down a list of oh I learned this 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 this, I think it's more of a feeling state, and that adds a new dimension to your life. Would you say that is it easy to let go of things? when we practice more and more mindfulness. In oh, lives. yeah, yeah. Um, because really the other part of mindfulness I haven't gotten into, but is you really start to notice how uh, things are always changing. And that's understanding impermanence, right? And so, and in fact, that was really the key of the Buddha's teachings was somebody once asked him, they said, Buddha, if you could tell us while standing on one leg, what you know, the core of your teaching is what would it be? So standing on one leg means as fast as you can before you fall over. <laughs> and and what he said was cling to no thing whatsoever. So non-attachment. And that is a beautiful, that's that letting go, that's releasing. We could release our expectations. We could release our desires, release our ego, actually, and start to see the things that how the, our, our identity is wrapped up in uh, attaching to things. From Buddhism perspective, those attachments, releasing those expectations, they sound easy, but don't you think we human beings are by default attached to things? We, we have expectations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, it's so true. And so I think in my own experience of it, Nishant, what I have noticed is I'll notice that when I am frustrated by something, when I'm upset by something, what this practice has allowed me to do is to now think, aha, so I am suffering. What am I attached to that is causing this? And then I can see what it is. Like say, is this, is this worth the suffering, <laughs> being attached to this? Maybe I'm attached to being right about something. Maybe I'm attached to wanting somebody to do something. Maybe I'm attached to an object or thinking I want an object. And so whatever it is, but I can feel my frustration or my whatever that emotion is with it, but it brings up for me, aha, this is a form of suffering. And what is causing it and could I let it go? So it's kind of a, a mental process that 
it becomes more visible. I th think before it becomes, and, and mindfulness makes it more visible. It helps you see it. It makes things appear more transparent to you, clearer. And it, it gives you kind of a mental clarity so that you can understand what's happening. And you decide to react. I could decide, no, I want it to be this way and I'm going to stay angry, <laughs> right? But at least it's a choice. It may not be the, you know, and I think we learn to be more choiceful through this practice of letting go. And we incorporate the power of pause and reflection rather than just reacting in that moment. Well, yeah. So I think that <clears throat> what I just described with you, to you is what happens when you pause. You're able to look at and reflect on, so what's happening here and how do I want to respond to this? And yes. if I am in a state of suffering, how can I uh, be liberated? What can I let go of or release? Uh, sometimes it's an attitude. Sometimes it's uh, an attitude of acceptance. Sometimes we can't change what's happening, right? There may be a health condition or there may be uh, somebody in your life who is abusive. And there may be different things that are happening that we don't have control over. but. What's important to know is that when I talk about acceptance, I'm not talking about submission as, oh, I give up. <laughs> I give up my willpower to do anything. But it's really about surrendering. And I think receptivity is a kind of surrender. And so acceptance is a kind of openness and a surrender to, oh, so this is how things are. You know, how can I be the best that I can be in this situation? How can I still be compassionate in this situation? How can I still be understanding? And in other words, we can say that not resisting to that situation, just accepting, but not being submissive to that situation. Well, I guess you could say it's non-resistance. Yeah, um, non-resistance or... I like to think of it as surrender or openness or receptivity. I think you could call it all, all of those things. So you have this whole online course and CD on this topic. Your karma is in the refrigerator. <laughs> could you please talk more on that? <laughs> well, your karma is in the refrigerator is all about how you can use food in a more enlightened way. <clears throat> and I actually worked in an eating disorder clinic for uh, several years, but my, my own karma was in the refrigerator <laughs> growing up, and, and how I use food was really very much to soothe my emotional well-being. And I got to, when I was in the monastery, I kind of had an epiphany around that, and that I could still notice the part of me that was craving food in a way that would make me feel better. And I could still honor the part of me that said, you know, you don't need to do that, but there's another way. And so I could honor, it's as if your container gets larger and you're able to hold all of your feelings without having to react negatively to something that's happened in your life or act out of a craving. And so it was a wonderful experience that I had. And I tried to do, allow that in this, uh, your karma is in the, is, it, is in the refrigerator CD is to have people experience food in new ways because we, mindfulness with food is probably what I think of as kind of what almost like the, the doctorate degree in mindfulness because our, our eating habits are so very entrenched or they can be from the time we're very, very young. And trying to change those can be a challenge. I worked sometimes with patients who had bariatric surgery or the laparoscopic banding. And they would say that after about 12 or 18 months at honeymoon period, that they had this urge to return to their old habits. And they said, you know, my, uh, my doctor operated on my stomach, but not on my head. <laughs> so you have to get to those deeper patterns. And so one way of looking at mindfulness is really pattern interruption, isn't it? It really takes you uh, beyond the old pattern. It gives you new ways of, of acting and being in the world. Let's say uh, this is, uh, I'm creating this 
picture right now. Let's say I am stress eating, I'm emotionally eating, and I'm eating whatever I want to eat in that emotional state. What can I do or what mindfulness practice I can implement in my life to avoid those eating disorder or avoid eating junk food or any food that is not serving me in my life? Well, you know, it's, it's probably a little more complex and I can just give you briefly here. Please. But I would say one thing is to name, give a name to the feeling that you're trying to make go away by eating the food. Okay. So what's happening is you're having an emotion and by naming that emotion that it actually has been found to be very regulating and helps us. You're now observing the emotion that becomes the object of your attention instead of just reacting to it. So maybe you're lonely and using food to cover up that loneliness. So naming that emotion, a lot, a lot of times it can be very hard to name that emotion for people or they haven't done it. And so I even had one woman, for example, who was a binge eater and she would go into fast food restaurants and order all, I mean, several thousand calories of food at one sitting and she would binge eat on that. And what I had her do is I had her, I said, I want you next time that you have that feeling that you need to want to go away through eating, I want you to sit in the parking lot first and give a name to that emotion. And then if you still want to go through the, the drive through go ahead. But at first, sit with that. And when she came back to the group, she, she told us how she had sat for 40 minutes. Imagine that, 40 wow. minutes sitting there trying to give a name to this feeling that she had never given a name to. And in her case, it happened to be loneliness. That's why I use that as an example. And she said, once I gave it that name, so she said, I didn't need to go through the drive through I drove back home. So, that is so powerful. Yeah. In fact, I learned this practice from Dr. Wayne Dyer's book, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. So what he mentioned is that if you are feeling urged to eat some junk food or anything, so instead of making a big goal, for a month of our 21 days, just, just ask mm -hmm. yourself, what can I do today to eat healthy? What can I do today mm. to just do meditate for today? Just for today. Not tomorrow, yeah. just today. Yeah. And also, you could use uh, visualization, guided visualization. Just picture yourself eating that food that makes you feel energized and makes you feel healthy. And even spending one minute just picturing that can be very helpful. Do you visualize every day in your in your life or anything? You know, I do use visualization sometimes, but and I think it's especially good if you want to create a new a new habit. And so to visualize yourself doing something can be very helpful. That's not something that's not a practice that I particularly use a lot of, but I but I see the value in it. I think also just noticing, I think another wonderful practice is noticing our strengths. And you talk, mentioned a resilience earlier, Nishat. Yeah. And, and so noticing your strengths, which I think a lot of us don't give ourselves credit for, you go through the day, you know, even if you get dressed, I think getting dressed in the morning is highly underrated. <laughs> when you think about it, you have to make decisions about what you want to wear. You have to follow through. Right, you got to put on those clothes. It's action, follow through. Uh, so I think that if you just get out the door in the morning, you've probably accomplished a lot already. And we tend to think of accomplishments as those big things at the end of the rainbow, that giant accomplishment that I want to get. But to get anywhere, uh, you have to make a lot of little accomplishments along the way. So I think even self care, getting enough sleep, eating enough, is an important way. Of, of preparing yourself for mindfulness. So, you know, in the Simply Mindful book, for example, I have one chapter on the, the, the five steps to great mindful self-care. And it's G-R-E-A-T, so it's an acronym. But that self-care, that's kind of like a boot camp for you can't really be mindful if you don't first do all these practices. Could you so, please 
explain in brief about this great practice. G -R -A -T. Yeah, the, well, the great practice, yeah, the G is for uh, gratitude and attitude. And that's about every day being present with a sense of gratefulness for things you notice around you or your attitude, having an attitude of uh, acceptance or an attitude of peace, right? Whatever, an attitude of kindness. So the G stands for gratitude and attitude. The R is relationships. So we need to have that relational peace that actually is uh, part of that prefrontal cortex behind the eyebrow ridge that actually makes us most human is wired for interpersonal connection. <clears throat> so we need to bring that into our lives. The, the E is for eating and sleeping. I talked a little bit about eating, but sleeping also is very important. There's something called, called the glymphatic system. And it actually, when you sleep, cleanses waste products out of the brain, including beta amyloid. That's a protein that's been implicated in Alzheimer's. So we really need to train ourselves. This is a this G-R-E-A-T is a really, it's kind of like a training, preparing yourself for mindfulness. And of course, the right proteins to have mental clarity and mental regulation, emotional regulation. That's the E. And then the, uh, the A is for activity. And so activity, getting some kind of uh, movement, right? It doesn't have to be uh, any kind of strenuous exercise, but just getting movement, getting your heart going doing some activity that is purposeful for you. Some physiological wonderful. activity. Yeah, maybe you uh, work in your garden. Okay, you take your dog for a walk. Those are wonderful activities that can get you out, get you moving. And then the T, it's a couple different things. T is for the tune-up. <laughs> and so I think of this as a mindfulness tune-up, some kind of mindfulness practice that you can engage in throughout the day, even once a day. Or even, and I think of the T, the T also as a um, as a boundary, as a technology break or technology boundary. As wonderful as technology is, and we use it, we need to do need to have a a break from it. And so, I love uh, your acronyms, uh, Tara. I, I was recording podcast with Tara Kuzno, and she mentioned about your glad practice. Now we have a great practice. Well. Well, I'm glad she mentioned the GLAD because that's uh, that's a practice I have taught, and I I developed that practice because I wanted to w find a way for people to get out of their heads and into their lives. And, Do you uh, mind talking about it for one minute about GLAD yeah, practice? Sure. So the GLAD practice is uh, G is for gratitude, and so the GLAD is something you could do in the course of a day and journal it down, share it with another. And so the G is one thing I noticed today that I'm grateful for. The L is one thing I learned today. And now this could mean I learned something about myself. Maybe I learned something about someone else. I learned some things about you in our talk today, Mishan. And or maybe I just learned something new and it's fun to learn and yeah. be curious. The A is one accomplishment. And again, to think of accomplishments and think of them as even those small little things that you do in the course of a day that help you move forward in your life, okay? Even those of self-care, acts mm -hmm. of self-care are an accomplishment. And then the D is, is kind of the affective part of this. The affect means an emotion, and that's delight. One thing of delight, one thing that maybe made you smile, that made you laugh. One thing of beauty that you saw. You know, I worked with a man, he had, uh, re he had acute depression. And I gave him the GLAD practice. And he, when he came back to see me, I said, so how did that practice work for you? And he said, well, when I got to the D, that reminded me of, uh, he said, I heard a bird chirping. I guess this was winter time in Portland where I live. He said, I heard a bird chirping that reminded me of springtime, and it gave me hope. Wow. Isn't that a beautiful story of how one little thing could help you? So it gives structure to our thoughts. It gets us out of our heads and gets us to see what's happening. And as I told that client, I remember <clears throat> I said, I, I have people people notice the glad in my office. But then I say, when you step outside, I want you to notice another glad. And every time you step over a threshold, whether it's, and you can think of a threshold as stepping 
out of one door into another room or another space. A window is a threshold. Every time that you're in a car and you're moving through space, that's another threshold. So every time you move into a new threshold, find your glad. Okay. We can just visualize about this yeah. glad practice. You could visualize it, or you could actually, if you're able to, you could take some pictures and share them with somebody. And I think what you could do a glad with a partner too. So I could share my glad, my gratitude, Please. For my partner, what I find, what I learned from them today an accomplishment I noticed that my partner uh, did or created, and then something delightful in reaction to my my partner. And then they could share their glad for you or could do it around a dinner table. So a lot of ways to adapt this practice. And it's one, it's interesting. It's one of the practices that I've created that I, has, I've seen people across the country who've written me and shared different ways that they've used it. One gentleman was a uh, pastor and he did a actually a sermon based on glad and i even had uh, <laughs> somebody who was a professor said he taught this he brought it into his classroom and he taught it to his students so it's interesting to see how uh, how it's made a difference i'm grateful for that this is amazing practice well, Donald, it's been a wonderful conversation with you. And before we conclude our conversation, I would love to ask you, do you have any closing thought for our listeners or where can our listeners find you? Anything you want to share with our listeners? Yeah. Please. Well, actually, uh, thank you for asking that. I Actually, I had heard your, your interview with Tara uh, Cuisineau and, uh, Cuisineau and you'd asked her about yeah. books. So I was thinking about books and I wanted to actually recommend I mentioned David Bohm earlier, B-O-H-M, and he wrote a book called On Dialogue that I like a lot. Also, Krishnamurti, who was a wonderful teacher, a world world teacher in the last century. And uh, you could find some of the books of Krishnamurti. He very much talks about uh, being present and just experiencing life in a very, you know, a very real way. And he kind of strips away everything and makes it very powerful. And then I'd also mention Lyle Watson. Lyle Watson uh, wrote a book called Supernature back, I think it was back in the 1970s, but that was about the Gaia principle. And he was really a visionary in a lot of ways, and his work is still very relevant. And Lyle Watson, his book, Gifts of Unknown Things, is a beautiful book about connecting with the planet and that this planet has so many mysteries for us. And we should never forget the mysterious and the divine that is around us. Oh, and? and the last thing I want to mention was, please go to my website, mindfulpractices.com, M-I-N-D-F-U-L practices.com. And I have a, you'll see my different products there that I'm offering, but also I have a Reflect community and you can sign up for that on that, on that homepage there's a link rather to my Facebook Reflect community. And uh, there's also a newsletter that I have that you can find on the subscribe button on the homepage of mindfulpractices.com. Wonderful. And I will put all these links in your show notes. Oh, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Donna. It was amazing, mindful, compassionate conversation with you. I really loved well, it. Well, thank you, Nishan. I'm grateful. You're part of my glad today. I'm grateful <laughs> Thank <to> you. you. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or you can visit https colon slash slash nishangarg.me n-i-s-h-a-n-t-g-a-r-g dot me you can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life you are not alone in this journey we all struggle in life there is no shame in talking about it i go through my highs and lows i get depressed and these practices help me in living a resilient life you can also do this you got this don't judge yourself you are doing the best you can and thank you so much again okay.